Entrepreneur's Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create a lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Justin Blinko, and today we have Michael Perklin, an accomplished security and investigative expert on the show. If you enjoy the show, please follow us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast. You can find us on iTunes and Facebook.com slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes with links can be found at LibertyEntrepreneurs.com. Just after six minutes into the podcast, the audio quality on Michael's side gets a little bit shaky. This lasts less than a minute, and the rest of the interview is absolutely worth listening to. Today we have Michael Perklin, Head of Security and Investigative Services at Ledger Labs, President of C4, Board Member of the Bitcoin Foundation, and Bitcoin Alliance of Canada. Ledger Labs is a Toronto-based consulting and development firm that applies decentralized systems and principles to the fields of security, finance, and governance. Michael is also a pun lover. So let's break down the firewall and chat. Michael, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thanks for having me here, Justin. In the news recently is a project you've been intimately involved with for the past couple weeks. Shapeshift had a theft incident. Could you give a little overview of the story for our listeners that aren't familiar? Before we get into that, I want to stress how uh, out of the norm this situation is. I've been a digital forensic investigator for 10 years, and I've investigated quite a number of of, uh, security incidents for a variety of Bitcoin exchanges around the globe. And in every single case, everything has been locked down very tightly. Nobody wants to admit that they uh, suffered a security incident or that they had a breach. And the fact that all uh, all of this is brought out in the limelight is definitely something that is new for me. It's, it's, It's not something that's done normally. That being said, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about it. For your listeners' benefit, uh, a quick synopsis is there was an employee at Shapeshift who, who stole money from Shapeshift. And later on, uh, after Shapeshift had uh, begun to move, move everything over to new servers, Shapeshift suffer, suffered two more breaches on completely different servers that um, the ex-employee uh, did not have access to. And it was learned after the fact that this ex-employee had installed a remote access Trojan or a rat on one of the employee's machines who was still at Shapeshift and sold access information of, of this rat to a cyber attacker so that a, a second cyber attacker could use this rat to get in and steal even more money. It was definitely a, an inside job that could not have happened had there not been a trusted employee within Shapeshift headquarters walls working alongside all the other Shapeshift employees in a trusted environment, had that element not been there, this attack could not have been possible. Trust is a word that's used very frequently in the Bitcoin world as Bitcoin changes the dynamic of who you need to trust and how. How should entrepreneurs go about the trust that they give their employees, the people that build the systems that they're creating? That's a very simple question, but unfortunately it has a very difficult answer. And that answer is, it depends. Every information system, and uh, so I graduated with a degree in information theory, and information theory is the study of information and the flow of information and basically the security of that information. An information system, by definition, isn't just the servers and the laptop computers and the the tech or the software you're using. Uh, An information system also encompasses the policies and procedures and the training of every single employee of that system. You know, if, if you think of Acme Widget Shop that sells widgets, there are people who answer the phones to take the calls. They answer, they enter the orders in. Yes, they may go into a, a server or, or, or some some tech. The tech will pump out a bunch of widgets. Some people will package them and, and send them off to the customer. There are people and tech and policies and procedures all involved in this one system that sells widgets to customers. So when it comes to any information system, uh, I guess going more to your, to your question, what every entrepreneur needs to do is not easy. They need to look at how their information system works. What are they selling? How are they selling it? Which uh, actors are involved? And an actor can be a human, like someone answering the phone and talking to a customer and taking the order, or the actor could be a machine, a order processing system that takes input from a human and instructs machines to print out 10 widgets on a 3D printer. Um, by looking at all the different actors in the, in the system, um, 
you can figure out where the trust points are and I guess where, where the, 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 the highest risks are. And when you find someone or some computer software to go and, and be that actor, you need to make sure that you can trust them. This can be done with either background checks or telephoning their references or otherwise learning a little bit more about the individual who you're about to place in a uh, position of trust. I'm sorry that wasn't an easy answer, Justin. It's a, it's a complicated subject. So you got a call from Eric Voorhees, the CEO of Shapeshift, that there was a crisis and you dropped everything. I, I believe I recall that you were on the way to the hospital and you just skipped that <laughs> and hopped on a plane yeah. to, yes, true. to go and help, help them out. Uh, is this something that you are doing very frequently, these emergency type of house calls? And what does it entail when someone says, I've been hacked, please help me? So handling cyber emergencies is my day job. Um, I've been doing it exclusively in the Bitcoin world for the last two and a half years when I started the company. But prior to this, uh, I was working for the largest telecom in Canada, and uh, I, I was working for their, their corporate investigations department. And regularly, everybody in the investigative department, we would need to be, you know, we'd need to have a go bag. And uh, if something happens, you have to get on a flight to Montreal or get on a flight to you know British Columbia or, or wherever. So this is my day job. But in actually in the last, uh, I guess it's 12, 13 years now, I've never been involved in a situation where this emergency is publicized so so publicly. So so this part of it is new to me. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in our in our conversation, it's right. very rare for people to, to to want to to let people know that they've suffered a a, a major emergency or or a cyber incident. And you're right. I was actually on the way to uh, to the hospital a few days before this happened. I I had an injury um, in a sporting event, and uh, I wasn't sure if I broke my toe or not. As the swelling continued, I realized it was about time for me to go and, and get it checked out. And just as I was getting ready to, to do this, I received a call from Eric Voorhees basically telling me that uh, because we had, we had discussed uh, some of these details uh, in, in the days uh, leading up to, uh, to his call, uh, he said, you know what, it happened again. We need you here at our, head, at our headquarters. So I dropped everything and I went. When you arrived, what happens next? And, and I'm sure some of this might be your secret sauce, but just in general, maybe this can be advice to entrepreneurs if they suspect an incident. What, what do you start looking for or at to figure out what has transpired? Well, uh, you sort of need to do two things uh, simultaneously. Um, one part is strictly investigative work. The other part is more digital work. Um, from, the, from the digital side, um, Anytime a computer is accessed or anytime a computer is told to do something, when you open up a program, when you tell it to shut down, anytime th anybody does anything on a computer, uh, it leaves traces. There are always digital artifacts that are left behind whenever something happens. So the, the best thing to do when, when an incident like this happens is to shut down or turn off or simply unplug any of the devices that may hold key data for the investigation. Aside from that, if there are any if there are any machines that require some kind of a, a one-time password or an encryption key, if those encryption keys are loaded, then you likely want to keep them online. That way, you can recover the, the encryption keys. But in 90% of the uh, the devices that have been compromised, uh, most people don't configure them with with encryption. So in those cases, you want to uh, just shut it down simply by unplugging it is the best way. Because even if you shut down, you know, on a Windows machine, if you hit Start, Shut Down, or um, on your Apple, uh, you hit the the Mac, uh, so the little Apple icon at the top left. Um, shutting down does a lot of things. It it writes a lot of uh, data to the disk, and every time you write something to the disk, you could be overwriting uh, some key piece of information. So the best thing you can do right off the bat is to shut everything down. Aside from that, the first thing that you do in any investigation is try to understand. Uh, your client knows a lot more than you do. They've figured, they have uh, information that was available to them that led them to the conclusion that they need outside help. So first thing you really need to do is just catch up to them. They're, they're a mile ahead of you. They're trying to um, give you a, an entire brain dump of everything that, that's happened over the last day, over the last week, or over the last month. In this case, there were some components of this that were uh, an entire month old from... Uh, fr from the stuff that I was investigating on the on the ninth, so 
uh, you just need to sit down with them and get the facts. Uh, I, I typically have a, a notebook and I, I write down everything that uh, someone is telling me. And this gets really uh, boring and really annoying, but you need to ask the same question multiple times to everybody that you've talked with. And the reason for that is simple. Our minds are kind of weird. They're not like hard drives or um, SSDs or something where once the data is there, it, it stays there. Uh, with every story, even, even this conversation that you and I are having right now, Justin, and that your listeners are listening to, there are two sides of the story. And actually, in this case, there are three sides. Uh, when I end this call and I walk away, I'm going to have an impression of everything that we, we, dis we discussed, everything that we talked about, I'll have in my mind. When you, you're, when you walk away, you're going to have everything that you um, understood as being talked about. But then there is also everything that we actually said. Now, with the benefit of a recording, we can go back and see the actual facts. But there are always those three sides of the story that party A walks away with, party B walks away with, and then C, the facts are somewhere in between. So by asking the same question over and over again to as many people that were involved, uh, there are always going to be subtle little differences in the story. But that's fine. That's that's just human nature. The, the role of an investigator is to separate opinions from facts and, I, and basically build a timeline. Uh, on this day and time, this occurred. On this day and time, this occurred. And you just start putting little pins on your timeline, uh, building out the story. Sometimes you may need to move a pin if one person said, well, I think it was in the afternoon, but later you find out it was in the evening. Um, and by the end of it, you'll have a complete picture of all the facts that occurred. And that's where you begin your investigation. With Shapeshift, you came to the conclusion that it was an insider. My impression of most of the Bitcoin hacks we've seen and probably many thefts and different breaches that you see reported on the news is that, that there's probably an insider in, involved in many of these cases. Obviously, you probably can't speak to uh, many cases in particular, but as an investigator, what can you tell us a percentage of what that's insider driven or what, what that dynamic tends to be when funds or information shows up missing? Well, I'd, I'd rather not make up any stats, but I can tell you right now that I don't have any, uh, any statistics on hand. The fact that the vast majority of companies that have suffered a, a cybersecurity incident don't report it to the public makes it very difficult to even know how many uh, incidents occurred, let alone how many of those had an insider component. What I can comment is just an aggregate of all the investigations that, that I've performed. There's definitely a vast majority that have some form of internal component. It, where, wherever there is an internal component, um, in most cases, the internal component was actively involved. Like an employee abused their access and maliciously decided to take things. Um, but sometimes it's not malicious. Sometimes the insider component isn't directly malicious. I have dealt with a, with a case where an insider was abusing their position to, to effect a, a, a theft, but it was against their own will. I don't want to get into the details, but you can imagine that there are a number of ways you can coerce someone to do something they don't want to do, especially if you know their family or you know a secret about them that they want to keep secret. Right. The, the, and the, the third type of insider component is, unfortunately, negligence. Some guy who says he is a security expert or he has all these skills on, on his resume. And of course, the management doesn't have the skills themselves to verify if, if he has them or not. But hey, who would lie on their resume, right? <laughs> so they're, they're put in a position to secure an environment and they say, yep, it's secure according to me. But in reality, nothing was actually done. And then 10 months later, somebody walks through a wide gaping hole that should have been closed by a, a competent security professional. And um, so although that has an insider component, that was n not direct uh, malice, although I guess it was negligent malice. A, a more honest insider would have told their employer, listen, I don't have the skills necessary to do this thing you're asking me to do. Uh, we should hire an external consultant to come in, do this job, and then walk away. At least then all of us will, uh, will have peace of, peace of mind. And that probably segues as well into C4. But before I get there, I want to ask one final question on, on the Shapeshift story. Sure. Uh, what should entrepreneurs learn from what happened, uh, how you and Eric reacted? What should the lesson be for all of us bystanders? Good question. I've, I've mentioned this to, uh, to a few of my clients, and uh, I, I think it's a very important message to all entrepreneurs out there. Actually, I believe Eric even mentioned it at one point in one of his uh, either interviews or in, in the long story narrative. But 
there always seems to be a reason to wait before you involve a security professional. Uh, once I finish the code, then I'll get it security audited. Once we go online, then I'll have someone you know, do a penetration test on it. These types of things. And um, in a lot of cases, the main reason is financial. Uh, like, I don't have an, enough money right now to hire a proper security professional, so I'll worry about it tomorrow once, we start to, once the money starts to roll in. And unfortunately, that line of thinking is completely incorrect. Not only are you putting your entire business at, uh, at jeopardy, your entire business's reputation at jeopardy, but you are actually going to be spending more money doing it that way. Now, if, if the primary motivation is to save money, then the best way to save money is to get a, a professional in right at the beginning, right at the architecting phase. Because once you've drawn all the boxes on, on a paper and you say, okay, well, here's how uh, the inputs will work of this system, and here's how uh, it'll send this data out, once you start mapping out all the interactions between all the various actors in the information system, and you have a conceptual idea of how the system will work, that is when you, you need a security professional to come, take a look at the high-level diagram, and start circling out risks. Here's a risk here, here's a risk there. Uh, it's very easy to re-architect a system when it's still in everyone's minds and it hasn't been put down in code. If, you're, if your coders spend a lot of time coding up this con uh, conceptual idea and then there are security vulnerabilities that are pointed out by a security pr uh, professional, they'll have to go back and recode everything. So you paid them for the first batch of development work, then you paid your security consultant, and now you're paying your developer for a second batch it's always cheaper to get them involved at the very beginning. That makes sense. You're the president of C4. Can you tell us what it is and why it's needed? Sure. Um, I think the best way to answer that question is to go back a little bit earlier to when I decided to be an entrepreneur. Perfect. So as I mentioned, I, I worked at a, at a large telecom in Canada in their corporate investigations department. And I really enjoyed my job nine to five because every day was a different investigation. And I guess someone who has a very short attention span like myself, it was, it was great to always have uh, something new to, uh, to work on every day. I, I was bit by the Bitcoin bug early, and uh, I, I loved Bitcoin so much that you know, I'd, I'd work 9 to 5 at my day job. As soon as I get home at 6 p.m., I'd work from 6 p.m. until 2 a.m. every night, maybe 3 a.m. every night, just doing cool Bitcoin stuff or doing a security audit of this company or a source code audit of that code. And it got to the point where I was enjoying my 6 p.m. to 2 p.m. far more than my 9 to 5. And I just left and I started doing, doing what I loved on my own. Um, that's actually another thing that I recommend to all your, uh, your listeners. Um, if any of them are like me, and uh, I don't know if they are, but enjoying your job is worth so much more than money. Uh, I, I took a large pay cut to, to do what I love and I would make the same decision every time. But anyways, back to C4. So I knew that I needed, uh, I, I needed help. I started taking on more clients, um, more work than I could handle on my own. And I needed people to work alongside me to help me do these security audits and write these reports and otherwise give my clients what they're, what, what they're asking for. And I was involved with the Toronto Bitcoin community at, uh, uh, at the time. And I was um, talking to a bunch of people and, and, I, and I found some people who would make great partners. Um, and then I realized, I know Bitcoin. So when I'm looking for another Bitcoiner, I can pick them up very easily. I know what questions to ask. You know, hey, is Bitcoin anonymous or not? If they say it's anonymous, all right, well, you don't understand Bitcoin as well as you thought you did. But there must be thousands of hiring managers out there in, in, in companies all around the world where their CEO is asking them, hey, hire a Bitcoin or blockchain person. And the hiring manager has no idea what questions to ask. They're going to look on a resume for, oh, I have 15 years of blockchain experience. Oh, well, then clearly this person knows what they're doing. 15 years is more than anybody else, not realizing that the very first blockchain was invented in, in 20, 2008. I mean, uh, it's impossible to have someone who's known blockchain tech for 15 years. Maybe so, they're so good at security, they kept it a secret. Right. So I, I recognize that although for most people who are Bitcoin enthusiasts like yourself and myself, this thing wouldn't necessarily be needed. But for the vast majority of the rest of the hiring world, it would be needed. So C4 was born out of that need to, to find a way to draw a line in the sand, uh, to, to apply a, a, a measurement that HR can look at and say, well, you know what, if you have the certified Bitcoin professional certification, then you know the bare minimum to do it. 
And that's sort of how C4 was formed. Uh, how are companies u- utilizing C4 today? Are there, uh, I'm, I'm reading articles every day of banks and consulting companies hiring Bitcoin and more, more usually blockchain experts. Are these guys using certification standards that you've set up or what is the role that C4 is acting in the, in the space today? So since the very first initiative that, uh, that C4 launched with, the Certified Bitcoin Professional Exam, C4 has actually grown to add on many, many more initiatives as well. Um, in addition to the CBP, there's the CBX, Certified Bitcoin Expert. Uh, if you were to compare the two, the CBP would be more like a driver's license. Uh, you know how to use the tech, but you don't necessarily know how the engine works under the hood. But you, you know, the blinkers and changing lanes safely, yes. Um, CBX is a lot more like the mechanics license, where if you were to open up the hood, you can tinker with the engine and you actually know how the engine works inside. Um, so the CBP is for non-technical uh, people who need to understand Bitcoin and understand about backing up the private keys. And the CBX is for the technical people who will be developing with, with it. Although the CBX isn't out yet, the, th- there's been an incredible amount of interest from, uh, from banks, from audit firms, from development firms, from very large software development companies that uh, e- every one of your listeners would definitely uh, recognize that are beating the drum just waiting for, this, uh, for the CBX to be out. On the CBP side, um, we have over 2,000 registered users uh, on, on, our, on our web application for the, uh, for the CBP uh, mark. And just looking at the email addresses in the, in, in the database, I, I can tell you that there are banks all over the world, there are auditing companies all over the world. Uh, the, it has reached so much farther uh, than I ever thought it, it would that it, it really validates the fact that this idea that I had was needed. Probably the most interest that we're seeing, though, is for neither of those um, certifications. Uh, the most interest we're seeing is for the CCSS, the Cryptocurrency Security Standard. Now, unlike the CBP and CBX, which apply to people, uh, their personnel certifications, the CBX, sorry, the CCSS applies to information systems. So, for example, Shapeshift. The cryptocurrency security standard uh, is similar to some other security standards that have, uh, have existed in the information security space for the last 20 years, but it applies specifically to cryptocurrencies. Now, some of your listeners may be familiar with the PCI standard, the Payment Card Industry Standard. That's a bunch of standards that were put together by Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and all of these um, uh, payment card industries uh, to dictate how end merchants will store credit card information. Because you can imagine every single time you go and you swipe your card at Target, they need to record that payment information somehow. Well, the PCI standard tells Target, you must encrypt this information this way. You cannot ever store the three-digit verification number on the back. You have to do this to your data. You have to do that to your data. They give a lot of prescriptive requirements for what Target needs to do in order to accept uh, credit cards online. Now, before this, the cryptocurrency security standard, every Bitcoin company out there was doing it was doing security their own way. You had MTGOX doing it one way. You had Coinbase doing it another way. You had Bitstamp doing it another way. Now, some of these companies managed to, to find a strong security professional and they were able to avoid an, any kind of hack or loss. But I'm, I'm sure you and your listeners know that some of these other companies that are listed definitely did uh, get breached. And the main reason was because everybody was doing it their own way. There was no standard for how to secure cryptographic private keys for the use in cryptocurrencies. And that's where the CCSS came in. Uh, we formed, C4 formed a steering committee with security professionals from as many exchanges, as many Bitcoin wallets, as many companies out there that we could find who had someone in this position. And we all started swapping stories. Tell me about this hack. Let's review the details of that hack. Let's review the details of that hack. And we we digested all the information together into a 32-point checklist, essentially. Uh, and these 32 points cover things like how do you create your private keys? How do you store your private keys once they're created? How do you use the private keys when you need to apply digital signature? Who is uh, is accessing your private keys and what diligence have you done uh, to make sure that they are trusted people to access your private keys. And finally, 
your system, how much logging is your system doing so that if something goes wrong, you have the evidence necessary to go back in time and identify exactly how the breach occurred. And uh, to put this in perspective with Shapeshift, Shapeshift was actually talking to C4 for, for a good month before uh, all, all these hacks came to light. Uh, because they knew that they they had grown very very wildly and and they were getting volumes much higher than they were initially getting when they first launched. They knew that it, the time had come for them to really start taking s- security seriously. So their engineers were already reviewing the cryptographic sorry the cryptocurrency security standard so that they can imp- implement it internally when all of this hit them. And it really underscores how these types of uh, of nonprofit initiatives. Uh, which don't make any any money for uh, for C4 or, or for the volunteers who provide their time. Uh, they do have a very very large, very measurable impact on all companies in the cryptocurrency space. Right. I'd like to ask you one more question about uh, digital security, and then move more on to the entrepreneurial side. Sure. Uh, as a digital security expert, th- this is obviously becoming a much more important part of everyone, just about everyone in the world's lives. Uh, the Security of systems becomes much more important as you use them more, which as the internet grows, we, we are forced to. Where do you see the future of digital security going as far as risks or uh, what things will have to be done that we don't do today or anything along those lines? Well, there's, there's a difference in answers there. There's what the, uh, what the media portrays the future of security as. There's what I personally wish the, per- the future of security uh, to be, and I get, I'd, I'd imagine that uh, reality is somewhere in the middle. So, in the movies, you always see security as biometrics. You see a retina scanner, you see fingerprint scanners, and you know laser lines going up and down a body doing some kind of a scan. And the the movies and media will tell you that that is the most secure thing that you can do. The reality is that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, biometrics are are definitely less secure than passwords and two-factor authenticators. Um, where I personally would like to see um, the future of security go is just like now, maybe 20 years after um, the internet really started to take hold in the, uh, in the 90s, uh, people have finally gotten comfortable using usernames and passwords, and more importantly, using different, uh, different passwords for uh, whatever they're doing. There are tools that make this easy, from password databases to uh, special password cards that allow you to assign a, a completely randomly num- uh, generated password to every service that you use. People have started to wake up that this is now necessary, but this is something that people were, were foreseeing back in the 90s, that you know, in order to secure yourself, you need to have uh, secure passwords. In the, in the future, I strongly believe that two-factor authentication will be the norm. Um, whether it's going to be everyone is used to carrying around some kind of a, a token on their keychain, like um, a, a YubiKey or something like that, or everyone is comfortable having a list of uh, Google Authenticator numbers constantly changing in their phone. Uh, it might, may even be a, a government-issued smart card or smart chip that uh, every, uh, every citizen has a private key assigned to them. And that private key is used to digitally sign things like healthcare, driver's licenses, uh, and, and all these other things. Uh, regardless of, of the implementation, I strongly believe that uh, two-factor authentication will be the norm. Um, and uh, I'm just interested to see how it'll, uh, or what shape it'll take. Thanks for that insight. Um, so as an entrepreneur, what, what motivates you? And... How have your mo- your entrepreneurial motivations changed since you got started as an entrepreneur? Hmm. I don't know if my answer to this question is going to be good advice for your listeners. You asked me an honest question, and uh, I'm, I'm an honest guy, so I'll give you an honest answer. What motivates me is fun and enjoyment. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, I, I had a really well-paying job at a really good and well-known company, and... I abandoned it because as fun as it was, this Bitcoin and blockchain thing was so much more interesting to me. And um, I have the, the type of mind where um, I, I need to have a puzzle. I need to have something to solve. And um, this was not just something that I was solving for myself, but this is something that th- there are enti- entire teams of people all around the world 
just trying to understand this thing. Uh, it, it was the, the, the beginnings of an entire new industry and all that excited me. So um, I became an entrepreneur because I wanted to enjoy my, my nine to five a lot more than I was currently enjoying it. And I was successful in doing that. I, I, the clients that I, I got, the jobs that I got, um, the work that I did was incredibly interesting. Now, not too often do I get to actually talk about what I do. Um, as I mentioned, this shapeshift case is the first time where I can actually talk about some of these details, which, uh, I mean, just from the, the reaction to everyone who's, who's uh, reading the stories and everyone who has sent me uh, very kind notes and emails, like, wow, Michael, I never knew that you did this kind of thing. That's really interesting. And I was like, I know this is this is why this is what motivates me. This is why I quit my job so I can do this type of thing every day. I guess if I were to give one piece of advice, uh, choose the thing that you love and figure out a way to make that your nine to five. Nice. So you mentioned that one of the sacrifices that you had to make to become a successful entrepreneur is the steady and, and nice paycheck that you had working for their, that telecom. Are there any other sacrifices that you've had to make? That definitely was a rather large sacrifice, um, and, but um, um, this is no different than any other entrepreneur out there. Uh, every entrepreneur lives by landing their clients, whether their clients are for services or their clients are customers for the products that they sell. Um, it's difficult to give yourself a paycheck every two weeks unless you have steady money coming in. And in the world of consulting, one month you may be up, the next two months you may be down, and you really don't know. Um, another sacrifice, uh, I would say that I, uh, uh, that I ran into, uh, when I became an entrepreneur is, um, name or brand recognition. Before I started my own company, you know, I would tell someone, you know, I'm, I'm the, the, the chief digital investigator, uh, working in the corporate investigation department for this telecom. Everyone knew this telecom and everyone was like, oh, wow, that, that's a really good job. And people decided to respect me because of a title. But later on, you know, a week later, I tell them, oh, yeah, I'm, I started my own company. I'm the CEO of my own company. I do Bitcoin consulting. Um, and you tell them the name of your firm and they've never heard of it. And they're like, really? Oh, OK, sure. And uh, as, as crass as it may sound, for whatever reason, a lot of people seem to judge you more on your title rather than who you are what you know or, or the type of personality that you have. And unfortunately, that is one small downside of, um, of all human behavior. I, I mean, I, I've caught myself doing the same thing too. I can't blame everybody for doing this because if for some reason, hey, when you recognize something, it, it clicks. Uh, our, our minds work by making connections all the time. And when somebody tells you something that you can't connect to what you already know, you don't really know how to process that information. So I, uh, I understand it, but um, I guess, for the first year and a half, um, you know, when I would tell people what I did, they didn't really find it that um, interesting. Uh, although for the last year, once I've established a name for myself and I established um, a reputation for what, I've, what I would have done, telling people the exact same information, now suddenly they make an association in their head like, oh, that Bitcoin thing, I've heard about that. Oh, yeah, that company Empty Gox, they lost so many millions. So you chase those people? I'm like yes, yes I do, and now it uh, I've come full circle. That's an interesting observation that I don't think many people would uh, think about uh, as far as leaving their you know corporate job with a, a good title, um, but it's definitely a, a real psychological aspect to the way we value success and and uh, instantly judge others. Yeah, you need to have a tough skin when you're an entrepreneur. Um, I, I, I'm very lucky to say that I, I had my, my, my father as a great role model. He, he started his own manufacturing company back in uh, 1980 or 1981. Uh, so so I, I saw a lot of the, the problems that he was going through while running his own business. As long as you, you don't let other people's opinion of you shape who you are um, and, and you, you just make your own decision. Like, I am this guy. I'm going to do this thing. And I don't care what other people are saying because this is what I want in my life. Uh, if you have the ability to say that confidently and strongly and basically seize that opportunity, you would make a great entrepreneur. In, in your job, you deal with probably some pretty high, high stress situations. Do you have a, a shortcut to successfully handle frustration and stress in your day to day? 
I do, although I don't know if I have enough time on this podcast to um, uh, to go through it all. But uh, in general, um, I just tell myself to keep my eye on the prize. When your emotions are high, uh, you you can't filter information as accurately as when you're in control. Um, so uh, whatever technique you have to calm yourself down and separate away all the all the things that don't matter right now and concentrate solely on the things that do uh, and just take it step by step by step. Uh, that's the closest approximation I can, I can give in, in the time that we have. Have you heard any good puns lately? <laughs> I have. Yeah. Um, I, I, someone made a joke and it was, it was definitely a, a pun and I said, no, 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 that's, that's a dad joke. And I told them, well, no, that wasn't a dad joke. That was actually a pun. And I asked them if they knew the difference between a pun and a dad joke. They said that they didn't. Uh, so I explained, a pun is funny on its own, but a dad joke goes much farther. <laughs> nice. Right on the spot. Good work. <laughs> Michael, how are you doing for time? Do you have any hard stops or can we talk for another 10, 15? My hard, my hard stop is nine. So I have another 17. I have a security quote for you and I'd like to get your perspective on it. Um, so Benjamin Franklin, in his wisdom, had a lot of quotes. One of those is, those who surrender freedom for security will not have, nor do they deserve either one. As a security expert, how do you interpret that quote and what Ben Franklin meant? So that is one of my favorite quotes. I've definitely heard it before, and um, I'm glad that you, you brought it up. Um, there is a very real difference between security and security theater. And I always try to make a very strict difference between the two. But I know that um, in, in, in the media these days and even in politics these days, um, the line between the two is constantly getting blurred. And the main reason is education or the lack thereof. Uh, when you don't fully understand um, a lot of the details, it's very easy to have the wool put over your eyes. Uh, the best way to make sure that you are not taken, whether it's uh, taken financially by a fraudster or taken mentally by, by someone who um, took your freedom or took your security because you weren't uh, fully cognizant of what was going on, is by educating yourself. And I would like to think, even though I, I don't know, obviously, but I'd like to think that Benjamin Franklin was hitting on that, that um, uh, an educated person would understand the differences between security and freedom and would ensure that they were able to keep both. That's my interpretation. Nice. Yeah, security theater is probably one of my favorite phrases to describe what I see going on a lot in society today of making things feel safe without actually any noticeable uh, increase in, in safety while surrendering freedom. Absolutely. And that's why I said earlier today that, um, that biometrics are being shown by, every, you know, by the news, by the movies and everything as being the future of security. But when you actually take a look at how biometrics work under the hood, you realize that it is not uh, more secure at all. Uh, and uh, if I may ed educate your, uh, your listeners a little bit, there are three main reasons why biometric security is inferior to passwords and tokens and other things that we already use every day. The first one is there, there is an error threshold with every biometric reader. Whether it's a fingerprint scanner that's reading your fingerprint or an iris scanner reading your, your iris uh, or, or your retina, um, all of these change. Our bodies are constantly changing, whether it's we're growing where we develop arthritis or we get a cut on our fingers, all these small little changes that happen throughout the day uh, change our bodies and they change the, the um, piece that the biometric scanner is reading. And that means that every biometric scanner needs to have an error threshold built in. That is equivalent, when you, when you just look at that as strictly the numbers, that's equivalent to saying, okay, well here you have this very secure 32 digit password. You only typed in 20 digits correctly the rest of them were all are wrong, but you know what? We'll let you in anyways because 20 out of 32 is close enough. Um, and that obviously doesn't, doesn't work with security. Uh, second reason is every biometric identifier is inherently public. 
Um, you, my face has been in so many pictures. Every piece of glass that I touch with my fingers, I leave my fingerprints on. Uh, I leave my hairs in every hotel room that I've been in. Uh, every piece of my body is constantly being publicly viewed by people or pieces of it are always falling off everywhere that I go. Uh, that's like the equivalent of having your password on a post-it note on your forehead because everybody can see you, everybody can capture it as they walk by you. That is not a way to secure a system. And the third and most important reason why biometrics are the worst form of security is revocation. If I lose my key, I can change the lock. If I lose my password, I can change the password. But if I lose a biometric identifier, like a fingerprint, I can't revoke my finger. That just means for the rest of my life, I can never use that same finger for any authenticator ever again because I know that somebody at one point copied it sometime. Every biometric identifier is like that. So, um, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that, def- that last part is definitely not something is non-obvious to me. Um, makes sense when you explain it. But, yeah, it's not something I would have thought of as the a huge risk. But now it's, yeah, it seems obvious that that's a huge problem for a good security system. Mm-hmm. I recently had Brennan Byrne, who's the CEO of Clef, an authentication company on Liberty Entrepreneurs, and he mentioned that he was in a uh, military entrepreneur, or a, a military development R&D lab maybe five years ago or so, and that they had technology that could pull fingerprints using a camera f- from someone from 20 feet away. So that, uh, you know, basically having your password on your forehead at all times is, is very real and the technology is there to to uh, retrieve that data. Absolutely. Uh, and if your listeners are wondering what the best way is to authenticate on a system, multiple factors are the way to go. Have a password that is long, uh, but even if that password gets broken, you should have a second factor like a Google Authenticator token or a YubiKey or something like that. You can buy cheap YubiKeys for, I think the cheapest versions are $8. And that will hook into your Google uh, Mail. That'll hook into a variety of different websites. Uh, they can all be configured. Actually, even a lot of Bitcoin exchanges. Uh, Kraken is definitely one of them. You can hook up your YubiKey to your Kraken account so that even if somebody does get your password, they also need that YubiKey. To wrap things up, Michael, is there anything about either the Shapeshift story or your entrepreneurial adventure that you uh, wanted to talk about that I didn't ask? No, I, I think we I, I think we covered it fairly well. I, I, I guess as uh, as as parting words, uh, I I'd always known when I was in my twenties that at some point in the future, after I got enough work experience, whenever that was going to be, then I would go out on my own and I would become an entrepreneur and I would start my own company. And it was always something that was going to happen in the future, and I never really. Um, knew when that was going to be, but I imagine it was going to be, you know, 35, uh, 38, or 40 years old, or something like that. Um, when I had this opportunity to start on my own, I knew I wasn't ready. I knew that I, like, I, I didn't go through the, that that other 10 years worth of uh, work experience to get what I thought I needed in order to do it. But I took a leap of faith, and it was tough. Um, I definitely survived on ramen for the first uh, couple of months. Um, but, uh, by sticking with it, I realized that the only thing that I really needed was to believe in myself. I didn't need that 10 years of experience, which would have allowed me to believe in myself. I could shortcut it and force myself to believe in myself. And I I realize that sounds strange, but if anybody in the, in your audience is teetering, should I take this leap of faith or should I not? Um, my recommendation is to jump in with both feet and never look back. Nice. Thank you for that that message. Uh, Michael, to wrap up, could you give us uh, your contact information that you'd like to share with our audience and who should get in touch with you? If, if anyone's uh, in, interested in getting in touch with me, you can reach me by, by Twitter. My uh, Twitter handle is mperklin, so M like Michael, and then my last name, Perklin, M-P-E-R-K-L-I-N. Um, other than that, uh, you're always welcome to email me at, uh, at Ledger Labs if you have any uh, work-related concerns. My email address is michael at ledgerlabs.io. Great. We'll uh, put that in the show notes. Michael, thank you so much for sitting down with Liberty Entrepreneurs. Have a great week. Thanks for having me here, Justin. You enjoy yours as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast with Michael Perkins. 
This show is hosted and edited by Justin Blinko. Show notes are found at libertyentrepreneurs.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook.com slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. You can find this podcast on iTunes or podcast players via our RSS feed. Thanks. Until next time.